Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is David Jordan. I'm the president and CEO of the United Methodist Health Ministry Fund. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on community health workers in Kansas. Today's webinar will cover the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities for community health workers in Kansas. As you, as you know, a community health worker is a member of the healthcare team who serves as a bridge between patients and providers. They translate doctor jargon, they fill out paperwork, they help patients navigate the system and connect them with resources. Um, CHWs help patients overcome obstacles to seeking care, such as transportation or language barriers. Today, we have approximately 500 community health workers helping patients better navigate the system in Kansas and helping providers deliver better care. Um, recognizing that community health workers make the system work better for patients and providers, um, the Health Fund has invested in supporting the use of CHWs in healthcare settings throughout Kansas. We're also partnering with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, the Health Forward Foundation, and healthcare and community stakeholders to establish a certification and payment policy to establish and sustain the profession in Kansas. Today, we have a great presentation um, on the community health worker movement in Kansas and exciting news on what's next. Um, our agenda for today is first, you'll hear from Dr. Sarah Jolly um, on community health workers in Kansas, strengths, challenges, and opportunities. This is, draws on research that was conducted um, last year and the previous year on CHWs in Kansas and opportunities. Then we'll hear from Sheena Wolsey, who is a community health worker. She'll describe the role that she plays in providing better patient care um, and share some important personal stories and perspectives. Then we'll hear from Ryan Lester and Stephanie Olson from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Ryan is the Bureau Director for Health Promotion and Public Health, and Stephanie leads the community health worker section. Um, we'll then hear from Rebecca Anderson, who is um, the Director of Population Health for KC Care Clinic on the importance of CHW as part of a care team. Um, thank you to all of the presenters, our partners at KDHE, Health Forward, and the Kansas Community Health Worker Coalition um, for promoting this important event and really the CHW movement in Kansas. Thank you all for your efforts. Now some quick housekeeping items before we get started. Given the large number of folks on this call, your lines are muted. However, we hope that you can use the chat function to engage throughout the webinar. Please introduce yourself in the chat and please ask any questions in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar and we'll take questions at the conclusion of the webinar. If we see questions come up in real time, we'll try to address them, but we also want the questions there so we can use the 20 minutes towards the end of the presentation to take these questions on and have a robust discussion. We also will plan to use the raised hand function later in the webinar um, if, in case folks want to speak, uh, speak up. Um, however, we encourage you to share what's on your mind in the chat throughout the webinar. I'll turn things over to Dr. Jarley to kick things off and thank you all again for joining us. Thank you so much, David. I am going to attempt to share my screen. You would, at this point, we would all be super good at this and I am still just doing my best. So can, David, I can see you. Can you give me a thumbs up? Are you seeing my slides? Excellent. Okay, then I will go ahead and get us started. So I am uh, Dr. Sarah Jolly. I work at Wichita State University's Community Engagement Institute. Um, and I had the privilege of working on a project with uh, the United Methodist Health Ministry Fund and David's team. Uh, and we learned a little bit about the strengths, challenges, and opportunities for community health workers here in Kansas. So I'm gonna give you just a quick overview of what we did and what we learned. Um, all of this information, should you be interested in finding it, is on UMHMF's web website at healthfund.org um, under the resources tab. So I'll reference that a couple of different times. Um, but as you can see, just a quick look at the types of questions we were trying to answer as we explored um, what is happening with community health workers in our state. Um, so we partnered to answer questions around how organizations are utilizing community health workers, where are they working? Um, what are the current needs of organizations that are either employing or utilizing community health workers? And what recommendations do these organizations have for um, the future initiatives that might apply to community health workers? So a quick rundown of the methods that we utilized. We did a literature review. So we looked at research connected to community health workers. Uh, we did an environmental scan of what other states in the country are doing related to community health workers. Um, we also conducted interviews, and we also uh, did some focus groups. And 
the focus groups were maybe one of the last in-person data collection things I did uh, before COVID. I think we did our last focus group in like January or February of, of 2020. Um, so these are the ways that we collected uh, data to help learn more about this. We also uh, created a map of where community health workers are um, and uh, created a directory. And I know for sure you can access the map again on UMHMF's website at healthfund.org in that resources section. So what did we learn? Uh, across all of those methods. So you, you saw me list about four different methods that we utilized. Um, so the strengths that we learned about for community health workers, there is really evidence out there um, to show the benefits of community health workers. So one is there is a financial uh, return on investment when you utilize community health workers. They are a low cost approach um, to helping sort of extend health and social services to folks who need them. Uh, it also, um, community health workers can help alter their clients or patients' use of higher cost services, so um, can avoid uh, having folks utilize the hospital if they don't need to. Um, we also see that folks have um, improved health outcomes when they utilize uh, community health workers. Um, so physical and mental health improves for clients or patients um, who are able to work with a community health worker. Uh, and we also found that there's increased healthcare accessibility. So you heard David talk about how community health workers kind of serve as a bridge. And so they, they serve as a bridge for the communities they serve with the formal healthcare setting, which can sometimes be overwhelming. Um, and I think one thing that's important to note is that community health workers really are part of a continuum of care. They are not a replacement or in lieu of other, other types of services that folks need. They are part of a larger continuum of care and are important to keep in mind in that. So what were some of the challenges uh, that we saw as we looked at this? So one of the challenges is that uh, just people knowing and recognizing what a community health worker is and what they do. They get called by a lot of different names sometimes, um, and they're kind of a more non-traditional type, uh, type of position and yet are embedded in a formal traditional healthcare setting. So having uh, sort of uh, campaigns to help people just in the public understand what a community health worker is, but to also help providers and those in the healthcare system uh, recognize and understand the value that a community health worker can bring. And again, recognizing that they're part of continuum of care, not um, something that's being offered in lieu of other care that folks might need. Um, and so again, just promoting awareness of community health workers, what they are, what they do, and where they can be beneficial. Um, another piece that's important is around funding for community health worker positions. So one of the things that we've seen is that community health workers tend to be funded by sort of third party grants and contracts. And while it's great that that funding is available, that type of funding long-term is typically not sustainable. Um, so thinking about other ways, alternative forms of payment would be important uh, for sustainability. And that's sort of what this next slide is about. So the opportunities that we have. So related to, again, the strengths and the challenges and the things that we learned across all of those methods. So there's opportunities to expand um, the community health worker profession. Uh, by creating a well-defined career path with opportunities for advancement if folks are interested in that. Um, so currently, maybe there's not a career path where somebody could set out to say, I want to be a community health worker and I know these are the steps I would need to take to get me there. Um, so related to that, having sort of some standardized education and training would be valuable. Um, being able to provide uh, appropriate continuing education for those types of things compensation for folks. And again, if folks wanted to advance um, to doing something else, uh, having a way for them to do that. 
another thing that you heard me mention, particularly as it relates to funding, is creating a path to sustainability. Um, so continuing to collect data that demonstrates the value of community health workers. And obviously there's a monetary value and that will be important to demonstrate, but there are also non-monetary value um, pieces that community health workers bring. So they help increase patient and provider trust. Um, so again, that bridge to healthcare services. And you heard David mention it as well, um, dealing with various social determinants of health. So if folks are having difficulty accessing transportation, accessing food, if they're having other issues, community health workers can help with that as well. Um, same with the expanding um, the community health worker profession, being able to standardize education and training uh, for this particular field could be a value uh, for everyone. And this could include uh, certification, which you're gonna hear uh, about later in the webinar. Um, and as I mentioned too, just being able to explore alternative funding. So whether that means uh, Medicaid expansion and finding ways to get reimbursed through Medicare, Medicaid, um, other types of service reimbursement, bundled payment options, uh, different ways to fund it in a more long-term sustainable way uh, would be beneficial. We also know the site of what connects community health workers so closely to their communities. So when we talk about things like certification or training or licensing, um, some of those formal things we don't want um, to result in barriers between community health workers and the people that they serve. So again, lots of things to think about, lots of things to balance. So those were just a quick, quick summary of the things that we learned uh, through this project. Uh, I, again, I know we went through that very quickly. We've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, so if you have any questions, certainly feel free to reach out to me. My email address is there. Um, as I mentioned, there is a brief um, on this, and there's also a full report that you can access on UMHMF's website, again, at healthfund.org, and it's in the resources section of their website. So if you click into resources, right there you can see um, where the links are to the brief, the report, the map, all of it is right there for you, you to find. And I am going to turn it over to Sheena. Stop sharing first. Thank you, Sarah, for that. I appreciate it. Hello, everybody. My name is Sheena, and I'm a community health worker with United Healthcare. And um, I'm just going to talk about a little bit about my role within the company um, as a community health worker. So if you'll go to the next slide. Is it not moving? I don't know if anybody can hear me. It, it doesn't seem to be moving. Okay. I wonder if I can share my screen real quick. That would work. Okay. Is everybody able to see my screen? No. No. Can you see it now? Okay, um, so um, what I do is I'm on the whole person care team. And what that means is we treat members um, individually as a whole person, whether that's their medical needs, mental health needs, or social determinants of health. Um, we just want to make sure that we're addressing any needs the member might have realistically as a whole person. And through that, we get referrals from several different um, referral sources, which is listed here, um, whether that's high needs, internal referrals from the health plan providers or other 
um, outside resources. Um, and then we deal with pregnant members and NICU babies as well. And so what we do um, on the whole person care team is we ensure members have primary care providers, they have specialists, they have behavioral health services, peer support. Um, we do consults with our behavioral health specialists to get members connected until they are set up with mental health providers. So we're meeting those gaps in between. We also work with getting them connected with transportation services, housing, utilities, food, um, making sure that they're safe within their environments, employment, and other community resources and community-based services such as waiver services or other needs that they might have. We also ensure members understand how to utilize the ER, how to get in touch with our nurse helpline um, before they utilize the ER to make sure that they're actually using um, emergency services that are appropriate. We also encourage members to maximize their ben benefits um, and maximizing, making sure that they're doing their wellness exams and talking with their providers about questions or concerns that they have about their overall health and how to meet those goals. We offer member value added benefits. So that could be food resources. Um, we coordinate with an outside resources, outside resource for our hunger challenge where they're able to get up to 14 meals delivered directly to them at no cost. We also make sure that our healthy first steps or our pregnant members also receive multiple benefits for when baby gets home that they have access to diapers, breast pumps, formula, anything that they might need um, and offer. I actually, we actually can send out coupons through different services and programs that they provide um, for those members. So what we do is when a member is referred over to us from a specific cohort, we outreach to them and we complete some assessments to see what barriers actually are underlining for that member. And then it generates goals that we work with the member on. And we have 30 day outreaches, but of course, a lot of the time we're more connected with our members um, more frequently than once every 30 days. Um, we meet their social determinant of health needs. So we get them connected with any, like I said before, any providers. We work with pharmacies um, to make sure that their medications are getting met and that they're getting those in a timely manner um, and don't have any issues. Also with DME needs, uh, making sure that they're getting their supplies. And then um, we make referrals to behavioral health or peer support specialists so that their mental health is a big part of their medical as well. Um, we do face-to-face -face visits as needed if the, if the members are in our driving distance. Um, we update the care plan goals and work those with the member. And once everything is met and the member doesn't have any further needs, we're able to close them out. And this doesn't affect their benefits or their health plan at all. Um, it's just making, it's just letting them know that there's nothing else that we can do for them at this time, but they do have our contact information and they're very aware that we're able to meet their needs and to address any barriers that they do have in the future so that they're able to contact us if they need us. And then as far as successes go, um, any little thing that you do with a member is a success in my opinion. Um, but I've, in the eight years that I've been a community health worker, I've helped get members a refrigerator so that they can keep their food and medications cold. Uh, I've worked with <clears throat> landlords within the communities to help get members stable housing. Um, I've also, <clears throat> worked with members on getting them with waiver services. So once they transition from my caseload to a long-term care coordinator, we're able to 
communicate any other needs that the member might have once they transition over to long-term care so that they're able to stay in their home in the community and still have resources to meet their needs. And then of course, medications, you know, members have barriers with medications and getting the medications that they need at a cost that they can afford um, and getting those approved so that if they don't have the financials to be able to pay for that medication, we're able to get that to them at no cost or a low, a low cost. I've also worked with Habitat for Humanity and getting a wheelchair ramp installed into a member's home so that he was able to actually get into his home after he was discharged from the hospital. And then <clears throat> we also do networking within the community through several different um, projects or groups that I'm involved with. And this was something that I did for the Wesley House um, within my community. And I did a donation through our NICE team. We all came together as a health plan and did some donations. And we were able to present to the Wesley House over $800 in cash. And then, of course, all this food to deliver out to the community. So that's a little bit about what I do with United Healthcare. And thank you for allowing me to present and share what we do on a daily basis. Thank you for all of the work that you do, Sheena. It's clear that you are embedded in the community and um, making those connections beyond the health system. So I think that's really such an important strength of CHW. So you, you really did a great job bringing that out. So thank you for the work that you do. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's really, I think what we see is the opportunity for CHWs in Kansas. So it's been great to be able to work with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, which it's clearly made a commitment to CHWs and sees the important work that, that you do, Sheena, and all of the other CHWs in Kansas making a real impact. So with that, I'll turn things over to, to Ryan Lester um, to talk a little bit about KDHE's vision for CHWs before he turns it over to Stephanie Olson. Hey, David, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk at you just for a few minutes. Um, you know, I, I, I can see by the, the level of participation on, on this call and all the work that's been done through the coalition and the uh, and, and United Methodist Health Ministries Fund, WSU and KDHE um, and, and the team at KU, the momentum around community health workers in Kansas is really building. Uh, and there are some great things that are happening. And you know, KDHE is committed to continue to to push this work forward, um, you know, I just you know, as as we hear about all of these these accomplishments, like the work that Sheena's doing, and um, you know, the systemic things that are that that are are coming and, and building, um, I just you know wanted to take a second to say, look at look at what's possible uh, when we're all working together towards a toward, towards this common goal of, of furthering the profession. Uh, it is. Pretty incredible. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it to turn it to Stephanie, and she can tell you about some of the things that are that are coming and growing and building. And thank you all. Thanks, Ryan. I feel like I, I get one of the funnest parts of this whole presentation. I get to announce that um, some of the work that uh, Sarah talked about earlier and some of the hopes and dreams that the coalition and all of the partners throughout the state have had for many years now have finally come to fruition. On April 4th, the coalition announced um, that they now have a certification process for CHWs in Kansas. So um, this has been uh, kind of one of their big goals from the very beginning. Um, just a brief brief history. Uh, in 2016, uh, the Kansas, Co Kansas CHW coalition was formed and one of their first projects was to have a sustainability um, committee um, come together and look at what certification might uh, mean for Kansas, how it might work for Kansas. Uh, in 2018, United Methodist Health Ministry funds, KDHE, WSU, the Health Fund, multiple partners throughout the state um, added to the coalition's um, kind of figuring and investigating and uh, formed a, a statewide uh, 
advisory group to look into um, certification and advocate for um, future sustainability in, in policy work. Uh, finally, in 2018, uh, the coalition called several um, several or 2022 uh, January and February called a series of meetings to um, affirm that the 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 uh, certification as it was written and and all of these groups cont contributed to uh, coming together was what would work best for CHWs in Kansas. Uh, they voted that indeed this would fill their needs and on April 4th the certification went live on the WSU website. Um, while we're speaking, um, KDHE is launching a new certification page on their uh, website. So um, that uh, information, how to be certified and that whole process will be live there. Uh, KDHE is also putting out a press release that I'll make sure is attached to the slides and things that that uh, United Methodist Health Ministry funds shares out with you all. But um, Sarah mentioned in her presentation that um, certification was certainly one of the pathways that could assure um, future opportunities for CHWs and the certification that the coalition has ratified um, includes some really exciting opportunities that will unify the scope of practice for CHWs in Kansas and um, really help put them in a good position for future opportunities, whether they be reimbursement through um, payer systems like Medicaid or private insurance payers. Um, or uh, just having a, a consistent and um, cohesive scope of practice that will allow employers to um, hire the very, the very best uh, for these positions. Um, the certification as it stands now includes both a pathway for being certified through education. So Sarah did a wonderful job of introducing some of the core competencies uh, trainings that are, have been offered in Kansas with partnership from the, the coalition. Um, there's also a pathway for uh, for experience. So um, CHWs who have been working for a long time in Kansas would will also be eligible now to take advantage of, of this certification. Um, along with the initial certification, uh, the coalition is so happy to announce that um, there's a pathway for recertification and our kind of next steps are building out some more topic specific education for CHWs to really advance in their career, um, be engaged with more, um, more specific uh, topic areas, chronic disease. Uh, we're also building out support, support materials to um, help uh, CHW is currently working really work at the top of, of this new licensure. Uh, some HIPAA uh, modules are on the horizon, along with eth ethics. And we're very, uh, I think some of our, our dreams are, are about to be realized, um, putting some real effort into expanding maternal and infant um, and behavioral health um, options for CHWs to further their education and really advance their career. And I think um, that pathway to sustainability, I, I just admire so much what the coalition has done in making not just this certification possible for CHWs, but really starting to envision what that career pathway for a CHW might be. So starting to think about mentoring projects and continuing education so that uh, this workforce that we're building will be very dynamic and fill the needs in Kansas for, um, for a long time coming. So, um, Stay tuned for more ex exciting things, but um, for now, um, CHWs, I think all of this momentum have, have really solidified into a, a way to move forward and, and be a really vibrant part of healthcare systems and community um, organizations and projects in Kansas. So, yay. Thank you, Stephanie and Ryan. It is really exciting news, you know, as somebody who's done a lot of work in workforce issues and looking at new professions, 
um, you know, having a certification process and standardized educations and competencies is really a critical step and just in, in really recognition of the profession in Kansas. So I think it speaks to the high quality work that is being done by community health workers like Sheena and by everyone as part of the coalition, as well as by the providers who are empowering them to, to make an impact on patients' lives and um, improve care and how they deliver care and make it more patient-centered. Um, you know, one of the most innovative FQHCs in Kansas and Missouri that has really done amazing work with community health workers is the KC Care Clinic. They have a hub and spoke model. They partner with um, community-based providers. They partner with large systems like KU and St. Luke's. And um, Rebecca Anderson's here to both sort of share some of what they do, but also react to um, just some of the news uh, and learnings that were covered earlier. So I'll turn things over to Rebecca. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here and it's so fun to hear all the work that Kansas has done. So congrats, um, you've really done made some traction recently. Uh, so Rebecca Anderson, I am the Director of Care Coordination at the Kansas City uh, Care or KC Care Health Center. Um, and I am here to talk about the importance of CHWs as part of the care team. So when, let me talk a little bit about our program and then I'll go into why I think the CHWs are important as part of the care team. Like David said, we are a hub and spoke model. So the minority of the CHWs at the clinic are actually um, part of the clinic and the majority of our CHWs are part of the community. So their contract through other organizations. Um, we hire, we train, and then we supervise those employees, um, which is a unique model and I think actually works really well because you can have a large larger group of CHWs that really support each other and the work that they're doing. So our, our perspective, and I'm going to give kind of two different examples of why CHWs are important as part of the care team. So when you think about the care team model and what traditionally has been set up, right, like what exists historically is nurses, social workers, doctors, and those are very important parts of the care team. I don't want to minimize that at all. But there are many things that those people are not. And when we think about what they are not, they are the very things that CHWs are. They're not always trusted necessarily in a way that they understand exactly what patients have been through. Um, they may be through experience of, you know, like learning and education, they understand disease states, but they maybe don't completely understand a patient's life and what they've been through. They don't have the ability to go out in the community, which to me, when you're using um, a workforce to in impact people, that has to be the way of the future because the time is so limited in a clinic or really anywhere where patients are receiving care that you have such a small bit to impact behavior and the CHWs get a whole different perspective by going into the community, being in the home. Um, the other thing is they don't really always understand your situation, right? Um, I mean, when you're thinking about using peers or you're thinking about using CHW, sometimes it's very focused. Like you're using someone who has diabetes to work with someone who has diabetes. Does a provider get that? Probably not, unless they also have diabetes. You know, I can speak for myself and saying like the people that have been the most impactful in my life are the people that like truly understand my situation and that I can trust and will listen to. And that's exactly what CHWs are. So I'm going to give you a couple stories of, you know, how CHWs are impactful. So we got a referral probably like a month ago, and I'm just going to call him Jay because we can't use his name, but he was in um, renal failure and he had for many, many years had diabetes. And, you know, I after you get a case and you're thinking about the story and it's like, oh man, like what would have happened if a CHW had worked with this patient at the beginning of this? Like, could we have avoided this renal failure? And I really think so, because even the traction that we've made in this small amount of time on this patient has been profound. So he's going to the doctor and the doctor keeps telling him, you know, it's, we're going to come, there's going to come a time where you're going to have to get dialysis. And the patient's like, doesn't, you know, like denial does not really want to go there. 
So they reach the point that the labs are bad enough that the patient needs dialysis and the patient kind of drops off the face of the earth. And so we're like, what do we, what do we do here? Like, you know, he has to, he's clearly not fully understanding or maybe not wanting to realize the full impacts of what happens when you're in renal failure. Um, he needs to go to the hospital because they need to evaluate if he needs to be on dialysis. So I try calling the patient. <laughs> I'm using a language line and the patient's just like, whatever lady. So I'm like, we're going to involve a CHW here. So we have someone who's Spanish speaking who calls the patient. They get the patient to go to the hospital. The hospital or the patient's admitted. The patient decides not to get dialysis at that point. Um, they're released on medications, but they're, they're much more stable. So the patient has a follow-up appointment and, um, patient, he, we call the patient, the patient can't come to uh, the clinic for the appointment. And this is where I think, you know, people often don't realize how impactful a CHW can be. So I'm messaging the provider. I'm like, the patient's saying they can't come to the appointment and the provider's freaking out. Like the patient has to be seen. The patient's <laughs> in renal failure. Like, I don't think he understands what this means. So I call the CHW back and he ends up saying, it. we're like, you know, trying to triage what we're going to do in this situation. I'm like, call the patient back ask the patient if you can go to the home and do a telehealth visit. And so he calls the patient back and he's like, I can come to your house and I can use my phone and we can call the doctor and do this telehealth visit together. And I'm just thinking like, you know, this is the way of the future. Like this is the way medicine needs to look like, right? Like there are patients that can't get to the clinic. There are patients that crisis has come up and we need to get to them because it's so important that they receive the medical care that they need. And that to me is why as part of a care team, CHWs are so, so impactful. We were able to get this guy to come in for his labs, which he had been, had delayed for like multiple, multiple weeks. He is now finally back in the hospital and has agreed to get dialysis. You know, and while it's not like really the ending that we would all hopeful, like you have a patient in kidney failure, like it legitimately having someone who he trusted and was willing to talk to, and he was willing to go to the hospital get, to get the care he needs saved his life. Um, the other example I'm going to use, you know, this is kind of like one of the things that I think that we're doing that's a little bit innovative, but to me, it's another example of just how cool CHWs can be part of a care team. So I reached out to one of our local hospitals, um, here, uh, University Health, they used to be Truman Medical Center and they have a long COVID clinic. And I was like, you know, I know what can we do to kind of halt people like in the community. We know in Jackson County, so many people are getting COVID, the vaccination rates are low. How do we stop this whole like cycle of people getting COVID and then getting long COVID? And they had just received their antivirals for um, COVID. Well, a lot of their patients ride the bus, right? So if I'm a patient, I contract COVID, I need to pick up my antivirals. We're like in a real dilemma here because how are you gonna do that? So I was like, why don't we use the CHWs? There's no reason that they can't come to your pharmacy, pick up those medications and then door drop them at the patient's home. And they were like, okay, let's do it. So we, um, one of my supervisors on the call, Treva, she actually went one day and she ended up, it was like very far away. It was like an hour away from the hospital that was where this lady lived. The lady was like so happy. She came out and she's like waving and trying to talk to Treva. And she was like, thanks. Like, you know, you have COVID. Um, but I'm just like, how would that lady have gotten there? Like clearly she didn't have transportation, right? Like what would have happened? And we potentially saved her life. We saved her from being hospitalized and potentially saved her from getting long COVID. And those are the type of use cases, I think, when people are thinking about CHWs, like the care that has to start existing if we really want to impact people's lives, it has to be out of the walls of the hospital systems and out of the clinics. And that is why CHWs are so important in the care teams. So I'm going to stop there because I probably went over my five minutes, but I get very excited about this topic. So thank you guys for having me and I'm open to any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And, you know, we're pretty much on time. So that's like a, a feat for any webinar these days. Um, so nice work. You stuck to, stuck to things. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Uh, please raise them in the chat. Uh, one thing that um, I think was sort of touched on um, inadvertently a couple of times throughout the presentation, but I think is important to some of the grounding is, is both as part of the research and also as part of the certification process, um, 
the KDHE and, and the WSU as part of the research really relied on the coalition to um, define a community health worker and they adopted a uniform national standard because I think a lot of folks interchange community health workers with care coordination and patient navigation and those are functions that CHWs do. So I, at the beginning of the research that WSU did and Dr. Jolly did is a common definition that's then been sort of picked up and used further. So it started with the coalition consistent through the research and the certification process. So um, Dr. Jolly, I don't know if it'd just be helpful just to ground us all in the definition that is being carried forward on what a CHW is, like who a CHW is. Sure, I would be happy to read off the definition that we utilized. Um, so we used the following. A community health worker is a frontline public health worker who is a trusted member of and or has an unusually close understanding of the community served. This trusting relationship enables the worker to serve as a liaison link intermediary between health and social services and the community to facilitate access to services and improve the quality and cultural competence of service delivery. A community health worker also builds individual and community capacity by increasing health knowledge and self-sufficiency through a range of activities such as outreach, community education, informal counseling, social support, and advocacy. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, that's really helpful. Um, I see a question coming in from John Fitzpatrick. What will the new certification be called and how will a certified CHW be designated? Um, Stephanie, I, I don't know if you could take that. And if not, I Alyssa may be able to. I, I don't think um, there's a title other than certified CHW as far as what, what the designation will, will give that person. Um, what was the second part of the question, David? Just a, how it will be designated. So, you know, I, I'm assuming that's probably yeah. the same. Yeah, so there is a an online application. You can also request a an application to mail in. Um, there, the uh, the coalition has a panel that will review all applications. Um, and I should say um, some of the requirements um, there there is, is an exception process too. For example, I know um, in the Kansas City area, they've run into, you know, if you don't have a high school diploma, you know, where, where can you get it? So um, this group decided to kind of bypass that that requirement um, or, or have some exceptions for, for cases like that. So um, that panel will review all applications. Then once the, um, once it's deemed that the applicant meets all of the qualifications. As far as like how KDHE steps in, um, yearly we'll review the, um, the requirements for certification, the requirements that the coalition is, is upholding for who can present the, the education piece. And the, the language is KDHE will recognize that requirement as, as the state um, certification. So I hope that answered your question. Alyssa, do you want to add, do you have anything to add? No, I think you did an excellent job describing that. So thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And I think that, that, that is really important, just both the details of the certification process and how CHWs can apply the credential. And then also just that the state is recognizing this certification process on an annual basis, um, because that really does also go hand in hand with discussions with Medicaid in terms of sustainability and payment for services wherever Medicaid lands, but in some ways it's really one of the things that needs to be checked off the box. We needed some certification process that's recognized by KDHE as we have these discussions about sustainability. So I was going to ask about that, so I'm glad you had mentioned that. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Shelly Duncan had another really good question about credentialing and really about who a CHW is in terms of some value here. And I think some of the strengths have been talked about in terms of creating pathways for CHWs. But, um, you know, I think there's the question about United CHWs in particular, which Sheena may take. And then just in general, I think it's important to take this question on, do CHWs require a degree? And, uh, and how are they engaged within the community? And I know that community engagement is a key part of their training, which is exciting. So 
Sheena, I don't know if you could talk a little bit more about CHWs at United and qualification specifically, um, but then there's the broader question about degrees, which aren't required, but I think that some context from folks would be helpful. And then the community engagement portions of the, of the training modules that exist in Kansas. Yeah, sure. Um, with United, you, do, you just have to have a high school diploma. Um, and of course, um, you have to live in the community in which you're applying for um, because we do field visits. We want to engage with the members face to face as much as possible. So you just have to have a high school diploma. You could just go on our website and apply if there's a position open. Um, and that's pretty much all you, all you need to have. You gotta know, you know about your community and what resources are available. Thank you, Sheena. And um, just as for just a brief introduction, Alyssa Rankin is the executive director of the Kansas Community Health Worker Coalition, providing support to the coalition of CHWs. And Alyssa, I don't know if it's appropriate, you could take this on both in terms of the career pathways for CHWs, but also some of the requirements and the training that you guys have streamlined as part of the certification, certification process in terms of um, the community linkages that are part of the training program to, to get at Shelly's point is how they, CHWs are trained to interact with community-based organizations so they could address some of these social determinants needs. Yeah, those are both really great questions. I think um, my first uh, answer is going to answer the question about um, feeding community health workers into other health professions. Um, we have had those initial discussions with higher education um, to help uh, community health workers who are interested in moving to another degree field or another profession um, to support them along that journey. We also have um, several universities that we work very closely with and are partnered with with our education program uh, who are integrated into our instructor, instructor team. Uh, so we're working on that. Uh, more to come on uh, those discussions. Now, feeding back to the first question about uh, the community and clinical linkages, how do, how do we train community health workers to uh, work within the communities? Uh, we have 100 hours of uh, in-class time that each community health worker is required to complete. And in addition to that, they are required to complete 60 hours of what we call service learning. So that is kind of a, has a preceptorship or a toolbox building um, feel to it, where community health workers are asked to go out and find resources and experience um, situations and from their client's perspective. So um, I think one of our community health workers here today, Treva Smith, gave a great example of this, um, how she uh, had to go out and go visit a location and she learned a lot of things about that location and what the perspective of the patient would be if they were going to that resource. So uh, we require 60 hours of um, experience building service learning. So that is in addition to the 100 hours of course time. So, and that includes core competencies um, that are outlined on our coalition website. And I can share that link. Excellent, thank you, Alyssa. Um, anyone, any other, other panelists have anything to add on this front? You know, related, I see a great question. Um, you know, have there been conversations about CHW matriculation and career pathways into other human service fields? I don't know if anyone wants to take that on. I can take a stab at that, answering that question just from experiences that I've seen. Maybe Rebecca can answer this too, but other community health workers that have kind of um, worked in the field for some time and then moved on to become other types of professionals. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Diana Lady, uh, worked as a community health worker for eight, nine years, and she is now training to become a social worker. 
Um, and then I, we have, I've seen several community health workers um, in Garden City, for example, who use their community health worker training um, and work as uh, the clinical experience pathway to get into medical school. So there are lots of examples of community health workers who have gotten a taste of working in the community and decided that they wanted to expand their work in a different way. So uh, Rebecca, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think those are really great examples, um, Alyssa, and we've seen something very similar. So I'd say as far as like, you know, more of a formal pathway. I haven't seen anything like that exist, but I think what does happen is people get experience and then they decide that they want to go on. So I really do like think that that is a way that you're impacting the community, right? Like someone comes on, they get a little experience. Oftentimes they get stolen, like other places will like snag them up and uh, pay them a little bit more and then pay for their school. So that's both good and bad. Um, one of the things I think people need to be thinking about and that we have designed internally that I do think helps with that is creating a career ladder. So we have different tiers of CHWs embedded as part of our um, team. So we have a tier one, a tier two, and then we're actually working on a tier three. Anyone on my team who uh, we haven't told that to because it's still in the works, the cat's out of the bag. But um, anyways, I mean, just as a way to, you know, give people a little bit of mobility upward and also with pay, I think is helpful because um, then you can make more money and then you can retain people a little bit longer. But I have honestly not seen, I don't think we've had anyone yet that has left that hasn't left for better pay and for additional education, to be honest. So I think it happens more often than it's probably talked about or even studied. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and I think it's really great entry points into the field. And it, I mean, I think it's great that you guys are thinking about ways to retain and create different pathways within the organization. Um, Mike Mitchell asked a good question, and Rebecca, I wonder if you have a take on this one. In terms of, uh, do CHWs have access to any analytics tools um, that, you know, reflecting the needs that may exist or serve, and then sort of predictive analytics? I also think it might be helpful for you to share a little bit about how you use um, some of the SDOH screening tools and just making referrals to those community connections too, because CHWs really just offer so much. Um, opportunity to improve patient health because they have that relationship, which is really the most important currency with patients, but then to use data really amplifies the ability for impact. So I don't know if you could share a little bit about this. Sure. Yeah, so our um, analytics tool, and I think everyone kind of has their own, is called Enterprise. So it's a care coordination database. That's something that we built um, as a way to pull out data, kind of analyze, and then be able to pivot to meet population needs. Um, we have quality metrics that we're looking at that are embedded into that, that we look at monthly to be able to determine, like, are we impacting the patient population? Are we not? And then we can, you know, trend that quarterly and also yearly. Um, ours includes a multitude of things. And we really like tried to build it so it was an analytics tool. I don't know kind of the depth that other people's go, but so we look at different domains, different social determinants of health domains. We actually have three different assessments that are built into ours. We have a COVID assessment that we built around COVID and is kind of tailored to the most basic things that people need, you know, during a pandemic. Um, some of the things that are on our original assessment include things like furthering your education, which we were just not finding that patients were like, I want to go back to school right now. So, you know, we can still create that as a care plan item. We still we can still assess for it, but it's not in the top things that we should initially be asking clients because we're finding a lot of people are in crisis and need things like food, clothing, toiletries. Um, and then we also have the resources that are embedded. Um, so, you know, you do the social determinant of health screening. Ours is on a scoring system one to five. So one is you do not have capacity. Five is you are completely self-sufficient and have capacity in the domain that you're working on. Things like transportation, health insurance, medication access, medication adherence. Um, and then our tool actually gives a score at the end. So the ASSM is an aggregate score on the patient that you can look at pre and post to see if they um, improved in self-sufficiency through using that tool. And then we're able to pull out things like, you know, what are the most common uh, domains that are used or what are the most common care plan tasks that are used within our population? Um, 
so our analytics tool we built ourselves. Um, you know, we kind of had to, like I said, build it from the ground up. But I can't speak 100% to it. That's not something that's standardized across states. That you know, everyone's using the exact same like database to be documenting. So I can't speak across all sites for what that looks like. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Mike. And I think Florence has. There were a couple hands up, David. Uh, Florence yeah. And Treva, I, I saw I Florence and, and Treva. Um, Florence, did you have a question that you want to raise and we'll go to Treva afterwards? Um, no, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to speak more to the analytics part and say that um, one of the things that we do with analytics at University Health is we, we talked about um, in screening for social determinants, we decided that we wanted to streamline and we didn't want to screen across the board. Um, we had talked earlier at another meeting we had today about when you're screening for social determinants, you have to be careful not to screen for things that you don't have solutions for. And so um, like the prepare tool has, a, it's very broad. So we streamlined to, um, screen for food insecurity, transportation, and access for medication, because that's, those are things we knew um, we, had, um, we had solutions for in-house, because our social workers told us um, and our, um, our social workers told us this, and then our accreditation team told us that the Joint Commission is gonna come after us if we uncover a need and we don't address it. So um, we decided to address things that we had solutions for. So when it comes to analytics, um, we also ha have our own homegrown tool. And what we do is when we address, when we do our screening, we pull our data and by, by, by unit, we gather those, um, those that screen positive for needs and um, find, um, re report these back to those units and the community health workers, we call them um, cultural health navigators at University Health and case managers get back to these patients and we give them resources. And we get back to them and see if they were able to access the resources that were um, given to them and help them, um, the ones that are in-house, we help them navigate through the system to get those resources. Like we have an in-house um, uh, medical, um, how, um, we have an in-house uh, discount pharmacy where patients can get medications at a discounted rate or at no cost. So patients can be navigated there if they don't have insurance. And um, they can, we also have uh, a pop-up food pantry that we can direct patients to. We can direct them to food pantries in their neighborhoods. We can direct them to logistic care or um, coupons um, of, on how to get to their appointments. So those are things that we do to help get patients the resources that they need through what comes up as we run our analytics. And that's what we do with the analytic data that we get through. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. That's really helpful. And I think a great example of how you can pair a community delivery, a delivery system that includes community health workers with data to address social needs, which, which we know can help improve health and, and save systems money. So, um, I'm excited about what the future holds for CHWs as we move forward. Um, we are at time. Treva, I, I don't know if you had a quick comment that you wanted to make. I know you had put something in the chat, just sort of highlighting some of the pathways that existed for CHWs. Um, and, perfect. And Treva, That's thank all you. I wanted to share. Awesome. Thank you for all your leadership. And Treva has 
always great to work with and helps lead our project at the, CH, at, at the United Methodist Health Ministry Fund um, on behalf of KKC Care Clinic. So with that, we are at time. Thank you all for joining us. If you have questions, please email um, please feel free to email me, david at healthfund.org or any of the presenters. We will be sending out a comprehensive um, summary of this presentation. There's a blog post to go with this, the press release from KDHG sharing the great news about the certification of CHWs, um, all of the presentations and some additional background information, including the report brief that Sarah went through. Um, thank you for your leadership, your partnership and, and helping move CHWs forward. If there's any future topics you'd like to see on CHWs, let us know and we can try to put something together. Um, with that, have a wonderful day and um, we will talk soon. Take care and congrats everybody.